So for those who don't know me, I have been trained as cardiac surgeon, but back uh, uh, in the early 2000s, probably some, some years before, I've been interacting with different interventional cardiologists, and I've been uh, early on uh, uh, involved in many procedures, many projects uh, on structural interventions, and I've been cross-trained in the interventional cardiology. On the other hand, today I'd like to bring my, uh, let's say, my surgical standpoint, because at the end of the day I'm a chair of surgery, and uh, I will share with you some stories. So first of all, I want to uh, tell you, this is going to be my story, and I am very happy to share with you, and everything that I show you is true. It's, it's coming from real. So I became a cardiac surgeon because once upon a time, being a cardiac surgeon was a privilege. Now, don't underestimate this assumption, because we will come back to this assumption later on. This is a picture pretty famous picture of people watching, uh, I think, dental coolie operating. There was a lot of uh, people around. It was really a privilege to become a cardiac surgeon in the 1890s. Uh, it was a, uh, a, a, let's say, ticket to ride uh, a, a good ride. Uh, but then a lot of things happened. Uh, interventional treatments uh, became more and more available and reliable, I would say, and uh, with time, Many of uh, many diseases which were originally surgical diseases became uh, uh, treatable with uh, a non-invasive approach, and there are many procedures today which are uh, now first-line option for patients. And surgery is uh, delivered only for those patients who are uh, ineligible for cadre-based interventions. And I think this is a very good thing. I'm very happy that this is possible because, you know, anyhow, uh, patient first, whatever is less invasive is always better. Now, this didn't come uh, in one day. It came in uh, more or less 20 years, uh, maybe less. The, the great acceleration has been uh, in the early 2000. Until 2010, we've seen almost everything, pulmonary, then uh, aortic, then, uh, then uh, mitral, only recently tricuspid. All this uh, revolution that we have seen has brought not only new interventions, but also new operators. Uh, the structures have been uh, adapted. Unfortunately, there is not yet new education. Probably what you are, do are doing now, the four bars, is one, of the, one example of how uh, independent learning uh, opportunities are probably more uh, uh, interesting and more practical than, uh, or, uh, than the official academic uh, uh, pro programs. Now, when we, to, but somehow we need to talk about future, and future uh, has been always very fascinating. I think everybody is fascinated by future. Uh, for those who don't know this, uh, futuri futurism probably is an artistic uh, uh, movement that happened uh, uh, more or less uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and it was based uh, really on the uh, love for technology, love for modern, love for whatever is new. To be honest, I am pretty sure in, in this room with you, most of the people in that room are very fond of novelty, very fond of uh, modern, of something new. And modernity means that uh, there is a kind of an obsession for something which is new. Uh, those uh, artists, uh, writers, poets, uh, uh, painters, they're really obsessed with speed and technology. At that time, you know, there was uh, uh, the speed cars and speed boats and, and, and uh, flight was becoming available. So speed and technology was the center of their interest. So for this reason, if I want to uh, uh, somehow capture your attention and to uh, please your, uh, uh, your willingness to see something completely new, something fantastic, I try to... Uh, to uh, 
surprise you with very complex procedures. Many might are treating one single patient. Probably this is not enough. I can imagine for you, are, you are also doing this since many years. Maybe I can uh, uh, impress you with a trans transcathed transfemoral mitral valve replacement uh, with cardio valve. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I can impress you with basilica. Imagine all these things are impressive, but not so much anymore. You know, I've, you have seen it already several times probably today. This basilica in a difficult case. Even if I show you this, probably somebody showed you already. This has been the most crazy procedure that I've done with the two boys uh, are in front of you with uh, Gustavo and Marcio. Uh, a simultaneous implantation of two valves in a, in a single patient in an impossible anatomy. So all this can be incredible. Now, what is the learning? In 20 years, we achieved something which was not imaginable only 20 years ago. and the lesson learned is that with the right tools, with the right imaging, nothing is impossible thanks to this uh, uh, dispersed or let's say general global intelligence, which is brought by a huge community of people who are working for the future. So nothing is impossible for us. We can do everything. Now, then the question becomes, what should we do? And now comes back my origin as a surgeon. For me, the procedure you see on the left and the procedure you see on the right is basically the same procedure. I don't see a huge difference. I have to achieve the same goal. There are two methods. One is more, one is more invasive. The other one is less invasive. But basically, both are a, a method to restore quality of life and life expectancy to those patients who are coming to my place. And whenever we see, whenever we think about what is good for patients, uh, I think uh, sometimes less is more. And I would say in most occasions, if you apply less is more, you play safe. This is minimalism in art. and. Uh, if you think about this, is a, on the left side is, is an early Picasso. Uh, Picasso wrote once, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but it took me a lifetime to paint, to paint like a child. Actually, it's not easy to simplify things. And there is, there is one master, which, is a, which is actually has been uh, one of my mentors, if not the most important one. I'm sharing the room with him uh, in the last uh, two years. Ottavio Alfieri, if you want to create an hashtag for uh, Ottavio Alfieri, is simplifying complexity. He has been the one who has been able to make uh, a simple procedure out of a complex uh, scenario. The Alfieri technique, or edge to edge, has been revolutionizing uh, atrioventricular valve uh, therapies. It is today the most commonly performed uh, procedure in uh, mitral and tricuspid valves. And actually, if I'm here with you today as a, let's say a famous guy, whatever it is, I don't, I don't care about being famous, I, but uh, if I'm here, it's not because I'm smarter than anybody else. I was there when things were happening. Uh, thanks, first of all, to Alfieri. I was involved in the Alfieri technique, and, and immediately I understood that, that this was a procedure that was so simple, so reproducible, that could be uh, delivered through a cater. At that time, I was very impressed by cater based uh, uh, technologies, particularly PCI. And I, I said, okay, this is so simple that can be done on a cater. And actually, it took 20 years, but then there was a confirmation. The quad trial has been confirming that uh, uh, you can save lives using the Alfieri technique through a cater. Many surgeons have been very reluctant to accept uh, this revolution. Uh, for me, uh, transcater edge to edge, as well as many transcater procedures, are just a natural evolution of surgery where not only we act on structures on the beating heart we also act on functionalities so we can uh, assess 
as we proceed uh, the result of each of our steps uh, during the procedure and accommodate according to the uh, physiology. And <clears throat> again, it's not because I'm smart, but because of the environment. Uh, I'd like to talk about a lot of things like uh, the importance of our connections, the importance of our exchange of ideas. This is me, uh, probably at, at the time I was still uh, having some uh, uh, a good time also with Deborah, I remember at that time, it was uh, many years ago, we were working together with Alain Cribier and many other things. But in 2002, I was in the, with the, for the first time, I was uh, with one uh, transcader procedure in my hands. It was a first uh, edge to edge device. Uh, on the right side, you see Bradman, who was the echo guy from uh, Vancouver, together with John Webb. And there are two uh, Edwards engineers who show me a 12 French device, which was av uh, available to uh, reproduce surgical edge to edge on a catheter. This was really a revelation. Uh, revelation. Honestly, it couldn't be possible without, again, other mentors, other friends, other supporters. Okay, I've seen things, but then somebody opened me the door to cross the borders and uh, this man is Antonio. Antonio Colombo uh, allowed me to come to his uh, lab. He, he really trained me in, uh, the, uh, in uh, interventional cardiology. Uh, I was almost quitting surgery because I thought it was a great uh, job. And Antonio is a person who is always open to challenge. So if I would like to ch uh, choose a a hashtag again would be open to challenge the person who is always finding new boundaries new thresholds checking for new uh, uh, pot possibilities and potentials this was my first art team actually when we talk about the art team i think about antonio uh, different uh, backgrounds different uh, 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 standards uh, different language, different culture, but one same objective. This was at the beginning a necessity. It was basically a way to survive patients. A real heart team is based on partnership because collaboration is not enough. This is a very important lesson I've learned very early on, and I still my uh, in everyday practice i look for i look for partners i don't look for collaborators my first hybrid room was uh, this one uh, very poor uh, uh, but this is also another learning that uh, you know technology and resources are important but uh, you know hard work commitment and the teamwork around yourself are even more important you can do whatever you can do and vision can be stronger than the challenges our life will be always be challenging. If you have passion for what you do, you can do whatever you want. In this room, actually, I've been working for uh, eight years, doing all kinds of uh, innovative procedures just with a portable CR. Obviously, <clears throat> in this process, I was facilitated by a network of people. Uh, the preclinical trials have been instrumental for me also to learn uh, some uh, tips and tricks to learn uh, the secrets of innovation, to get in touch with uh, a lot of colleagues who are innovators as well, and to have fun lately. On the other hand, it's been a hard time with uh, long days and short nights, uh, lots of birthdays which were celebrated abroad, uh, having a lot of doubts, a lot of ideas, but uh, still very importantly, building a network. Thanks to this, I've been able to participate to early feasibility trials for first in men. I, I collected overall more than 15 first in men in my career, and always is a challenge. This is always a big challenge. Uh, the, the, the day you need to bring a new procedure on a human being, you feel the uh, load of responsibility towards everybody, but overall, and most of all, uh, uh, over the, the patient who is. Uh, uh really uh believing in what you do and you need to be very serious when you do first in man so after that 
I have a huge network and people I can really share uh, my, my knowledge. And this is another lesson I learned that nobody can uh, really become anything by themselves. We need to be all together. Being in a network is fundamental, like what you do tonight, today, uh, uh, you are all together, build your network. This is the strongest uh, asset for your life. One of the one of these uh, uh, assets have been uh, a community of alumni. Uh, again, uh, uh, you can recognize uh, the faces here of, of uh, some of you. Uh, this is probably one of the first, uh, uh, one of sorry, one of the last uh, meetings which was held online during the COVID. You can see some friends here, but this uh, uh, the CAS uh, uh, experience has been a, a real revolution. Because probably for the first time, uh, we were able to be all together in one room, surgeons, interventional cardiologists, imagers, even anesthesiologists. And uh, we became a team. We became a, 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 a network of friends and experts who are ready to work together. So we've been able to reproduce the importance of, uh, of innovation, which was in the early days of cardiac surgery. A lot of visiting people uh, in Zurich now is starting again in, in, in Milano. Again, network is fundamental. Network is fundamental for the future. And if I think about surgeons, surgeons are very important as well, but obviously structural interventions are going to be the leading uh, uh, methodology to treat procedures, uh, to treat valve, valve disease and other structural diseases. And this is fundamental when we think about uh, our future. We need to understand that there is, a, there is a trend towards less invasive procedures, which are changing the way we deliver our, uh, uh, our, uh, uh, our work. We deliver our service to patients. We change not only the, the way we treat, but also the targets of treatment. There are a number of challenges ahead because although the, the market is growing and I believe Brazil is growing very fast, still there are many difficulties. Uh, and I will, uh, I will, I can talk about hours about the challenges, the challenges ahead, but the most important challenge is and will always be the, 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 the uh, availability of people to change. You know, the change is uh, evident. Uh, if you see uh, this the shift of procedures from surgical ORs to cat labs only in four or five years in the United States, one of the most uh, uh, traditional and, 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 and slow to change community, you understand that everything is changing very fast. And this is not because only of... Uh, of data, but imagine what happened a few years ago when uh, uh, we changed uh, from uh, treating the end stage and elderly patients to patients who are much younger, much younger and uh, and uh, and uh, very famous. This is uh, Mick Jagger after uh, Tavi, few few days after Tavi. This is stronger than any evidence. Patients are going to ask us every day the least invasive procedure. They don't care too much about, about long-term outcomes. We need to tell them what is meaningful for them. But obviously, we fight against the very natural concept that nobody likes to be cut open and nobody likes to feel pain and nobody likes to, feel, to stay too long in the hospital. So uh, trials have been demonstrating uh, somehow a, a, an advantage of transcatheter procedure compared to surgery, and uh, surgeons may become reluctant to change. Although this is already changing, sometimes again uh, there are several matters of concern. I don't. I'm not sure that that uh, the game is over. If you think about PCI and cabbage, there is still discussion. What is the best way to treat people? 
And I don't think we should really close one door. We should not close one, uh, one uh, unit. We should be, uh, keep our eyes open, keep uh, analyzing and identifying subgroup of patients where one or the other procedure is more advantageous. And, you know, I, I've seen a lot of comments in, in the social from surgeons being very reluctant to change. We need to work more all together. Because the problem at the end of the day, and this is another lesson I've learned, and I've learned it very well uh, in Zurich when we established this uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, lessons, the CAS, is that actually the conflict between surgeons and interventional cardiologists can be never ending because it's like in soccer, this is my hometown with uh, Roma and Lazio. Uh, if you are a Lazio fan, you hate the Roma fan. If you are a Roma fan, you hate the Lazio fan. It's almost uh, physical. And you will never change your mind. If you are born Lazio, you die Lazio. If you are born Roma, you die Roma. You change your car, your house. You can change your profession. You can even change your gender. You will change your wife, but you will never change your team. And I think I'm, I, you know what I'm talking about in Brazil. So... The reality of this conflict brings us in the daily practice that the heart team meeting, for instance, the valve team meeting is not always a great uh, experience. It is a good experience, for instance, I'm sure that uh, Marcio, Gustavo, you have, a, you have a network of good friends. So in this case, it's good. But in many hospitals, the heart team meeting is more like a, a, a session with gladiators fighting to achieve the, the patient and the DRG associated with the patient. So we need to change this aspect, and this is only possible if we keep uh, uh, meeting together and if we keep talking together. This was my, uh, uh, my luxury, that I was able to talk with the diverse, diversity. I've been able to get in touch with interventional cardiologists, with uh, non-interventional cardiologists, and so on. I think the new team has to be more inclusive. And there is, above all, one important reason for that. Because change is happening and will change again. I'm not sure that we will do TAVI for the rest of our life. And if we want to survive the change, our community has to be as diverse as possible to uh, protect us from any potential change that can disrupt our routine. There are many reasons why change is happening. Imagine globalization. What you see now is uh, a so-called uh, third world countries coming, okay? Third world, you know, it's, they are becoming first world. Uh, China, India, but even Brazil, many uh, and Poland in Europe, many countries which were in the background, they're becoming stronger and stronger. They, it will be flooded by globalization. And in an in a, in a environment which is, over, is uh, over and over requiring more and more uh, 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 attention because, you know, we have a growing population with a lot, of, uh, a lot of elderly people and less younger people. And there is a huge threat, which is artificial intelligence. It's a threat or is an opportunity. It all depends on us. You know, I think uh, about the evolution of humanity. Obviously, we are very fearful of, of artificial intelligence. On the, other, on the other hand, we use it every day. Our iPhone, or our uh, Samsung is working, living, uh, having fun with us. It's controlling our life. It's actually uh, our Google is, uh, is, is monitoring our activities, suggesting us what to do next. And above all, uh, if you have a consultation and somebody comes with a special uh, syndrome, I'm pretty sure you go on Wikipedia, you write the syndrome, you find uh, what syndrome is that. So obviously, we are already working uh, together with uh, an extension of our, uh, uh, our intelligence. It is an extension at least of our memory system. It's like having a, a portable... Uh, memory system attached to our brain. It's uh, me and my watch in the future is going to be more and more uh, embedded into our, you know, the iWatch is already attached to, to, the, to the body, and in the future will be me and my implant. It will be something inside of us 
uh, giving us uh, uh, feedback about a number of uh, uh, physiological uh, feedbacks. So we're entering, actually, the era of the cyborgs. This is going to happen very soon. There are many smart devices, many uh, implantable devices, which are going to give us feedback on uh, physiological uh, outcomes. And basically, if you think about Iron Man, is a man with the elbow. So actually, uh, cyborg is not so far away. We have Iron Man walking in the street almost every day. And these wearables and implantable sensors are going to be everywhere. And we are going to be flooded by this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, information. So that in the future, we will see a, probably a fifth revolution, which is going to be a, 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 a system which is uh, regulated by a interaction with humans and machines and we will get so much information that will be only possible by an artificial intelligence to manage all this information. Imagine the difference, you know, in the, in the scenario when humans are becoming less and less uh, uh, prone to hard work. These kind of pictures will not be seen anymore. This is uh, people who have been working for more than 24 hours in a day. And this is not happening anymore. The books are obsolete. You know, today knowledge lasts only a few few minutes. Uh, it's already old. Whatever you write, so we are moving constantly away from uh, the status quo. The change is uh, embedded in our society. In only hundred years ago, we were still in the era of having care, taking care of people. Imagine in the fifties, in nineteen fifty whatever we started treating heart disease. Before, it was not treatable. Most of, most of diseases were deadly diseases. 50% chance of dying of acute myocardial infarction. Today, is much lower than 5%. And we are going towards prevention. I think many of our efforts in the future will be preventing uh, measures. Because I really believe that uh, we have been very good in these years in structural heart to treat patients. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we, we have been palliative, we have been adopting palliation. Sometimes we should think about prevention, but there is another, <laughs> another important area where we think, uh, uh, we, I think we should play a role, which is stabilization of disease. Imagine early intervention in mitral valve uh, functional mitral valve regurgitation. Imagine the implantation of a, of a loop recorder, the implantation of a uh, pressure sensors in the body to stabilize heart failure. There are many things we can do with structural interventions which may change the way we treat patients. They may change the way the natural history is uh, influenced by our actions. Because we have to think uh, differently. Surgery was one single procedure, hopefully, in the lifetime of a patient. With structural interventions, we go from index procedures to multiple index procedures, uh, which are embedded in a plan, in a care plan uh, for lifetime management, where uh, drugs and devices interact in uh, improving quality of life and prolonging life as much as possible with the least possible uh, effort for the patient and the least possible uh, risk for the patients. To do so, again, once more, we need to understand nothing can be done alone. We have to work as, as a network. We need to create the network of care around patients where everybody has a role, everybody, uh, the, oper the interventionalist, the, the uh, imager, the, the cardiologist, whoever is uh, useful can have a role here. So there will be a job for everybody. Don't be, sh don't be afraid about the job in the future. Artificial intelligence will come, but if we uh, agree, if we understand how to interact with that, it's going to help us, it's not going to be a threat. I think in Europe we are moving slowly in the, uh, in the direction of value-based healthcare. You know, in the DRG-based healthcare, you are paid per performance, which means the, the smarter, the faster you are, uh, the more efficient you are, the more you gain. In the future, doing procedures will not be paid. 
you need to do procedures which are associated to benefit. And therefore, in value-based eye care, more than the technical skills will be important to the, the competence, the judgment uh, uh, of the physicians, because efficacy will be more important than efficiency. Having this in mind, and I'm going to be almost at the end, I like to remind you that surgeons are also interventionalists. Uh, we talk about interventional cardiologists, we talk about interventional imagers. I think we should talk about interventional surgeons and even intensivists. This picture shows a number of surgeons who have been so influential to go where we are, from Forsman to, uh, to Lillehei, uh, to, to Fogarty, Inoue, Alfieri, and so on. And many surgeons have been influential to develop interventional procedures as, we, as they are today. So in this condition, we had to build down fences. We need uh, more bridges, less fences. We need to uh, strive for uh, a, a diversity-based uh, working environment where everybody has a voice. And this goes well beyond gender. I think uh, should include gender, but not only gender, should include uh, uh, professional skills, should include uh, the background and so on. We need to work together. We need to learn again how to work together because as we become more specialized we need more people around ourselves to deliver uh, a, 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 a good treatment so let me just go uh, at the end of this uh, talk uh, uh, mike mac has been asking me several times francesco are you a surgeon or a cardiologist actually i, I want more more often uh, prizes as a cardiologist than a surgeon. And I think if a cardiac surgeon is defined by a knife, by the loops, uh, then is a, is a, uh, I am a surgeon. But I think uh, this is uh, the, uh, the real moment where we have to break down our job description, create a new job description based on uh, our final asset. I go back to this picture. Walton Lillehei was a surgeon. This guy has been a pioneer. This guy is not different from Alain Cribier. He's not different from Ted Feldman, from Jean Webb, from Gustavo, Marcio, uh, whoever is in that room. Whoever has uh, curiosity, <coughs> whoever has a willingness to uh, feel emotions during what we do, then uh, this is our passion. This is what we need in the center of our life because we need to inspire the new generations, you know, with our experience, we need to bring all together and uh, we need to uh, teach the new generation that hard work is the center of success. And at the end, the future leaders will understand that uh, uh, the concept of a single uh, superman, super, superwoman doesn't work anymore. We have to work in a, in a condition where we are a group of superheroes, the Avengers. We need to be a group of, of people working together because only like this we have the potential to change the world together. With this, you know, I, I apologize if I was a little bit too philosophical, guys, but to be honest, uh, it was an occasion to talk to you uh, like it was a few years ago in, in Zurich together with friends. And after this philosophical discussion, let's be more practical. And I apologize if I said too much fufa. You know what is fufa? In Italian, fufa means blah, blah, blah. So thank you so much for having uh, me there. And I hope I can see you more uh, closely next time.